I'm happy to uh, talk about my experiences as the project manager of the Asteroid Redirect Robotic Mission. This was a concept that uh, we came up with in 2012, and in 2013, NASA gave us the go-ahead. And our initial concept was to rendezvous with a near-Earth asteroid and capture it, and then return it to cislunar space, and then send humans out to explore it. There was an alternative concept, which was to go to a larger asteroid, a larger near-Earth asteroid, land on it, pick up a boulder, something three or four meters in size, and return that to cislunar space, and again, explore it with human astronauts. That mission became the baseline, and that mission was enabled by solar electric propulsion technology. We were advancing the state of the art by a factor of 15 with a high power 40 kilowatt EP system. Also, we were building on technology that had been developed under satellite servicing to do the robotic capture. As if that mission wasn't hard enough, we also had a very complex interface programmatically. We were working for three directorates. We were under HEO, STMD was providing the key technologies, and SMD was supporting. We were a multi-center team. We had a key, key participants, key partners for the Glenn Research Center uh, for EP, Goddard and Langley for the robotics, and of course JSC for the human, human phase. And of course, we were gonna be working with industry. We had an industry bus. So given all those challenges, the uncertainties and the major constraints, I said up front that we need to be flexible technically and programmatically. I set the tone that we needed to be adaptive and creative about what we did and how we did it. So one of the most important directives I gave up front was that we needed to stay in architecture space as long as we needed. And that included working with external customers within NASA and outside NASA and internal stakeholders, the project team, the centers. And all of that had to come together before we would be able to begin any process associated with requirements. It was interesting how many times I had to tell members of my team, there are no requirements yet. We're still in architecture space. One of the most important things we did in this architecture space was to develop a concept of operations. That was the first thing we did. Concept of operations that addressed all the mission phases. The launch phase, the cruise phase, the asteroid operations phase, and the human operations phase. And each of those phases was defined by the phase lead and captured in a state-of-the-art model-based systems engineering model. And it wasn't until we had completed that model, added as many swim lanes as we needed, and reviewed that, that I said, okay, now we can start defining requirements. But I want those requirements to be functional requirements. We're not going to go write requirements for everything to define what needs to be done, because we've done that with the concept of operations. So we went, the, we went to an MCR and a combined MCR KDPB, sorry, KDPA in early 2015. And this was an, a KDPA with the APMC chaired by Robert Lightfoot. This was a very innovative idea. We actually used the APMC as our board. Um, and again, that was part of this creative environment that we uh, established and, and uh, continued to nurture. Uh, we got to phase B in 2016 and we were on our path to PDR uh, planned for late 2017 or, or early 2018. I think, as most people know, uh, the mission was actually canceled uh, in mid-2017 due to budget issues. It was not canceled due to anything associated with the technical implementation of the project. Um, I think the project team, and it was noted by Robert and Gerst, um, needed to take credit for the fact that we really fundamentally changed the way NASA thinks about electric propulsion. It is now an integral, integral part of the planning in human exploration. Uh, the, plan, the power propulsion bus, which is the centerpiece of the Deep Space Gateway, 
is derived directly from the work that the ARM team did. And I think setting that tone of flexibility and creativity, um, I, saw, I saw the team members, the project engineering team, just take that and, and build from that. It really brought out the best. It, it inspired them, I think, to be as good and as creative as engineers can be. And, and I think that really showed up in what we were doing. I'm not sure I could be so general as to say what most get wrong, but I think related to the, the, the key directions that I just talked about is I think that there's a tendency on the part of project managers and system engineers to fall in love with a design early on, lock it down, and, and start writing requirements way too early. Um, and what unfortunately that does is, is as changes show up both externally and internally, uh, and the design that you fall in love with turns out to not be robust, then you start you get into trouble. Uh, technical issues, cost, schedule, um, and and that's unfortunate. And I think that comes from not having been disciplined enough to work and operate in architecture space as long as you need to, um, and get and part of working in arch architecture space means getting. Uh, agreement with your key customers, external and internal, and having a concept that is robust to what you can anticipate to be the uncertainties that will show up in the future. A good architecture is robust against the unknowns that, that, that inevitably come in a, in a development. And to the extent you've done that job well, uh, then you're, you will stand the test of time. And again, I'm not sure I always give good direction, but I part of the one of the things I learned back on Mars Pathfinder, uh, where I was the flight system manager and, and later the project manager, was something uh, I learned from an interaction I had with the administrator of NASA, Dan Golden, at that time. And uh, Dan looked me right in the eye and he said, "Brian, I want you to take risk, but do not fail." Well, most of the time, people just got to laugh when you tell them that. Um, but that's a riddle, and I figured out the answer to that riddle. And that answer is what I talked about and what I implemented on ARM. The answer to the riddle of take risk, don't fail, is kind of known to every successful entrepreneur or explorer. The key is to be creative about what you do and how you do it. And so I took, I've taken that to heart on every project I've worked since then. And I think, again, it's a very powerful way to think. Uh, it create, gives a lot of opportunity for creativity in, in, on the part of individual engineers and part of project managers and even with our, some of our customers. So um, that's, uh, that's where I learned it. I picked it up from, uh, from an admonition from Dan Golden.